Christians have debated uh, the millennium for really 2,000 years. Uh, the millennium is uh, referred to only one time in the Bible, in Revelation uh, chapter 20. There we read about a, a thousand year period. Uh, the, the three main views that are out there are uh, post-millennialism, pre-millennialism, and amillennialism. In, in post-millennialism, Christ will come to reign on earth um, after a golden age. The word post means after, after the millennium, after the thousand years. The post-millennialists, however, do not typically interpret uh, the thousand years literally. So they understand the thousand years in a symbolic way. So for some post-millennialists, the millennium began right when Christ was uh, raised from the dead. Uh, that thousand years is interpreted symbolically, obviously, since we've had around 2,000 years that have passed. Uh, other postmillennialists think that the millennium begins at a certain point of time. But again, it doesn't have to be a thousand years. In the postmillennial scheme, because of the preaching of the gospel, the world gets better. The world is improved by the proclamation of the gospel. Uh, many Puritans believed in postmillennialism. Yeah, a, a nice handy way to read about postmillennialism today is in a book by Ian Murray called The Puritan Hope. So he uh, explains the postmillennial view. Postmillennialists today, you have theonomists uh, are typically postmillennial. Maybe a well-known person who's post-millennial is uh, Doug Wilson. But in the main, post-millennialism isn't very popular today. It's not, it's not really uh, a, a view held by very many. It's a minority view. Um, I, I think there are some exegetical problems with it. I think one of the exegetical problems is there are, I think, indications in the New Testament that there's a period of declension before uh, Christ returns instead of things getting better. Uh, if, if you read Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 21, postmillennialists typically take that passage when, when Jesus is riding on the white horse to refer to the progress of the gospel uh, throughout this age. So things are getting better and better as the gospel is proclaimed. But I think that passage is much more naturally interpreted as most people interpret it, to refer to the second coming of Jesus. So we could talk about postmillennialism for a long time, but I'm not going to talk about it further since, since it is in a view that a lot of people uh, are espousing today. So the, the two views that are more popular today are premillennialism and amillennialism. So premillennialism, and pre and then millennial, premillennialism teaches that Christ comes physically and bodily to earth and he reigns on this earth uh, for a thousand years. So in postmillennialism, remember Christ comes to earth after the thousand years or at the end of the thousand years, after this golden age on earth. But in premillennialism, he comes before the thousand years and he reigns on earth uh, for these a thousand years. Most premillennialists believe that the thousand years are literal. But actually, you don't have to believe that to be a premillennialist. You could understand that thousand years to be symbolic of a, of a significant period of time. So you would still be premillennial. You would still believe that Christ is reigning uh, personally and visibly on earth. There are also different stripes of premillennialism. You have uh, historic premillennialism. It's, it's called historic premillennialism because... Uh, some of the early church fathers were premillennialists of this sort. Uh, that includes church fathers like Irenaeus, uh, Papias, uh, Justin Martyr, and, and others. So the, the, these are church fathers who lived in the early centuries of the church, and when we read them, it's clear that they're premillennialist. But another stripe of premillennialist that's very popular, especially in the United States, is dispensational uh, premillennialism. That dispensational scheme um, understands the millennium in terms of the dispensations, and, and especially in dispensationalism, there's a, a, a strong separation between Israel and the church. 
So in the dispensational understanding, Jesus reigns from Jerusalem and Israel has a, has a very special place in the millennium. God, God rules the world through, through Israel. So the nation of Israel has a, has a prominent place uh, in the millennium. So there are many dispensational premillennialists, there are historic premillennialists. And now, now I'll say a word about amillennialism. Amillennialism is really not the best title because amillennialism literally means no millennium. <laughs> you really can't believe in the Bible and not believe there's a millennium because Revelation 20 is clear there's a thousand year uh, reign of Christ. So uh, a, a better term for this is amillennialism. Maybe that's the name premillennialists gave it or postmillennialists gave it, but amillennialists believe in a realized millennium. That, 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 that the millennium is, is taking place now. So in the all-millennial understanding, the millennium begins at the resurrection of Christ. The, the number of thousand years is clearly symbolic. And most all-millennialists believe that, that Christ is reigning in heaven with the souls of those who are Christians. So believers are reigning in heaven in their intermediate state. Before they're raised from the dead, they're reigning with Christ in heaven during this thousand-year period. And, and this thousand-year period will culminate with the coming of Jesus Christ. So what, let's talk about um, the advantages and disadvantages of these two views, the premillennial view and the um, amillennial view. We won't, we won't get into the details of dispensational or historic premillennialism. Yeah, but good arguments can be made for both. It's a really difficult issue. I'm thankful most Christians today don't think this is an issue we should divide on, and I'm in complete agreement with that. I think it's too difficult of an issue to uh, divide over. Furthermore, it's not that important. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, we're interested in it, but it, it shouldn't be an issue that we break uh, fellowship over. And I think most believers agree with that today. So um, arguments in favor of uh, premillennialism, if you consider Revelation 20. Well, one of the arguments is in Revelation 19, verses 11 through 21, Jesus comes on the white horse, he returns, he destroys his enemies, he throws the uh, false prophet and the beast into hell. And then Revelation 20 opens, and, and John says, and I saw. And then in this passage, the angel comes and uh, throws Satan into the abyss, into the pit, for a thousand years. And premillennialists argued, look, uh, we have a, a sequence here. First, in Revelation 19, Jesus returns and destroys the beast and the false prophet and the enemies the human enemies allied with that. And then in Revelation 20, we have a new event where he, the angel takes hold of Satan and puts him in the abyss uh, for a thousand years. So that's one argument. Another argument in favor of premillennialism is that in, in Revelation chapter 12, Satan is cast down to the earth. So he's thrown to the earth when he has that big battle with Michael, but he's still active on earth. Whereas in Revelation 20, he's put into the abyss. So uh, what premillennialists say, it's in a very good argument. Look, in, Re in Revelation 12, he's cast down to the earth, but he's still active on earth. But in Revelation 20, he's thrown into the abyss, and the abyss is locked, and it's sealed, and he doesn't disturb people for a thousand years. And they say, those are two distinct events. This uh, sealing and locking of, of Satan into uh, the abyss or the pit, They'll say, that, that just hasn't happened yet, which, which leads to a third argument. It's really quite, quite similar. Right now, Satan is the god of this world. He's the prince of the power of, of the air. Right now, he's still deceiving people. He's deceiving nations. But Revelation 20 says he's locked in the abyss and that he can't deceive the nations anymore. So premillennialists pre say, obviously, that hasn't happened yet. Satan's still deceiving the nations. So we, we have not yet seen this thousand-year period where Satan is uh, locked into the abyss and he's not uh, deceiving the nations. A fourth really good argument for 
the premillennial view is, is John talks about these martyrs in Revelation chapter 20. And John says they came to life and they reigned for a thousand years. And the argument is that that verb, they came to life, means they are raised from the dead. You can look in chapter 2. Uh, we have the same, the same word that is used in terms of Jesus himself. And clearly, it means Jesus was raised from the dead. And, and more than this, so you have the, these martyrs who come to life, who are raised to life, resurrected in the premillennial view, and they reign for a thousand years. And then in a thousand years later, the rest come to life. Same verb. So it's, uh, there's a sequence. A thousand years pass, the rest come to life. Even all millennialists argue that the rest coming to life includes the physical resurrection. So that's very interesting, isn't it? The first verb, the martyrs come to life and reign for a thousand years. Premillennials say that's a physical resurrection. All millennials don't think that first resurrection is a physical resurrection. But the next statement, and a thousand years later, the, the rest come to life, and they argue that includes a physical resurrection. So this is a little bit complicated, but premillennialists say, I think the argument overall is simple, premillennialists say, look, the verb means the same thing. In both cases, it refers to a physical resurrection. So that's, that's the fourth argument. There's a, there's a literal physical resurrection. Fifth argument, if this passage is not talking about a literal physical resurrection, Revelation never mentions. They're, uh, the physical resurrection of believers, specifically. And that seems really strange in a book that's talking about the end times. Sixth argument, I mean, there's more. We could go on this forever, right? But the sixth and final argument, uh, th that first resurrection that I talked about, the martyrs who come to life, right? John, John comments on that a verse later, and he says, this is the first resurrection. So that word, resurrection there, anastasis, N.T. Wright, wrote a book called The Resurrection of the Son of God. What Wright argues in this book is that the word anastasis always refers to physical resurrection. Always. Interestingly enough, though, Wright argues that, but when he comes to Revelation 20, he says, well, actually, it doesn't mean that here. <laughs> it doesn't mean physical resurrection here. This is an exception. But the premillennialists can rightly say, well, wait a minute. It means this in every other case. It must mean the same thing here. The burden of proof is on anyone who would say the word doesn't, doesn't have that meaning. So, premillennialism, whether historic or dispensational, we can argue about that, but it has some great arguments in favor of it. And, uh, and maybe I hope you're even convinced by it, hearing it. I, I hope you hear, wow, those are, those are great arguments. But what about all millennialism? So I, I would actually say I slightly, uncertainly, tentatively, haltingly, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday, more than that, actually, I, I tend towards all millennialism. But it's, but it's a very difficult issue, and I'm, I don't feel certain about it, and I wish I actually had more uh, certainty about it. But, but what are the arguments in favor of all millennialism? So the first argument is, nowhere else in Scripture do we read about this thousand-year reign of Christ. And it's simpler to say the second coming and the last judgment take place at the same time. Because if you're a premillennialist, right, you have the resurrection of the saints and the second coming uh, separated by a thousand years. So that's, uh, that, that's possible, but that's not as neat and clean. So in the amillennial scheme is cleaner, Jesus comes, the dead are raised, it's the last judgment, you, you go into the new heavens and the new earth, Revelation 21 and 22. So that's, that's the first argument. It's, it's, it's simple and it's clean. You don't, you don't see the millennium spoken of anywhere else. Second argument, and this one is very interesting, a little bit harder to understand, but Old Testament texts that are regularly appealed to in defense of premillennialism. So I'm talking about texts like Isaiah 60, Ezekiel 40 through 48, the building of the, the rebuilding of the temple. We can just use those as examples. There are other passages. Those, those texts that are regularly understood by premillennialists to refer to the millennium are not mentioned 
or alluded to at all in Revelation 20, but in a most fascinating way. When we read Revelation 21 and 22, those texts are all over the place. You have, you have many allusions to Isaiah chapter 60 and Ezekiel 40 through 48, the rebuilding of the temple. But Revelation 21 and 22 is talking about the new creation. So, <laughs> you know, the, I think that's a problem for the pre mill view. You know, with a, with a literal hermeneutic, they say, look, these passages are going to be fulfilled in the millennium. So you have a, so, a so-called literal building of the temple. But John says in Revelation 21 and 22, in the new creation, there is no temple. And yet that's the passage where it has many allusions to Ezekiel 40 through 48. So I think that's a problem from the premillennial view. The so-called passages in the Old Testament that supposedly support premillennialism, they're not in Revelation 20. They're in the new creation text. Thirdly, what about, what about Revelation 20 itself? What about the argument that you have a sequence in chapter 19, verses 11 through 21, Jesus returns. Then the next event in Revelation 20 is that Satan is uh, thrown into the abyss by the angel. I mean, I mean, of course, that's possible. But you could also argue that what we have here is recapitulation. One of the features of Revelation is Revelation is recursive or it recapitulates, retells the, the, the same events from different perspectives. And it's a very interesting thing here because in Revelation 19, John alludes to Ezekiel 38 and 39, but he also alludes to Ezekiel 38 and 39 in Revelation 20 in the judgment of Satan. And, and I would argue, along with Dan Block, who I think wrote the best commentary out there on Ezekiel, Dan argues that the judgments in Ezekiel 38 and 39 are the same judgment told from different perspectives. Do you see my point here? My point is the judgment in Revelation 19 appealing to Ezekiel 38 and 39 and the judgment in Revelation 20 appealing to Ezekiel 38 and 39 are, are referring to the same account, the same story, just from different, different perspectives. So it isn't so clear that we have a sequence here. It could be the same event. You know, you shake up the kaleidoscope, but it's the same event told from a different perspective. I think that's uh, more likely. So, so fourth argument, what about the fact that, that Satan is thrown into the abyss and he can no longer deceive the nations? Again, I wanna say the premillennial argument is very good and maybe it's right, but I, but I think there's a good answer to that. And I think the answer is we remember when it says Satan has cast the earth and Satan is cast into the abyss. We have to remember we're dealing with apocalyptic language. We have to be careful not to overly literalize either of those visions. So, so what is the point of both of those visions? Are, are they harmonious? And I would actually argue they refer to the same period of time. That is the period after Jesus' death and resurrection. So Satan is bound and put into the pit for a thousand years, but Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says he has come to bind the strong man, which is clearly Satan. So I think if we look at Matthew chapter 12, that, that binding of Satan is understood to have taken place in Jesus' ministry through his cross and resurrection. That can be pictured, Revelation 12, as, as, as Satan being cast to the earth. And it can be pictured as Satan being cast into the abyss. But what about the point, Satan can't deceive the nations. Isn't he deceiving the nations? But I think all males have a good reply to that. And, and the reply is this, that in the old covenant, God's special people was Israel. And the gospel was not going out to the nations. Satan was deceiving the nations virtually, completely, comprehensively, totally. So uh, all millennialists are not arguing. Uh, Satan is not doing any work of deception now. I think he is. But Revelation 20 is speaking specifically to the issues. Is Satan deceiving the nations as a whole so they're not hearing the gospel? And the answer is no. In this present evil age, the gospel is going to the ends of the earth. And some from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation are believing. 
So, so Satan, Satan is bound in the sense that he's no longer preventing the nations, as in the Old Testament, from, from hearing the gospel. Fifth argument, what, what, about, what about the statement that the martyrs came to life and uh, reigned for a thousand years, which I'm going to mix this together with, and John saying this is the first resurrection. Maybe I'll talk about that last part first. Remember what I said about N.T. Wright. Anastasis, the word resurrection, always refers to a physical resurrection. And then Wright says, but it doesn't in Revelation 20. And, and, and some people say, well, you're, he's, he's basically cheating. But I think Wright could be correct here. I actually think he is correct. I mean, why would he even say that? I, I think the, the answer is we're dealing with apocalyptic literature. The, the terms, terms take their meaning and context. And so we have to be careful when we're talking about apocalyptic, and especially the way the book of Revelation is, is written, over-literalizing the use of a term. So I would argue that that first resurrection is spiritual. It is, it is the, the reign of believers in heaven with Christ. That's the first resurrection. And that is the sense that John has in mind when he says they came to life. Yes, there is a second coming to life where it's physical. But Meredith Klein has made a very interesting argument here in regard to these things that I think is helpful. Meredith Klein says there's a first resurrection, which implies there's a second resurrection. The first resurrection is spiritual. That second resurrection is physical. And John speaks of a second death. The second death is hell. But there's a first death, isn't there? There's a first death where people do not know God in this life. And, and we're all born into the first death, so to speak. But the decisive issue is do you experience the second death? So you see the parallel here? First, first resurrection means you have spiritual life. First death, spiritual death. Second resurrection, physical resurrection. Second death, physical resurrection and, and life and hell. So I think that's a good uh, amillennial answer. This debate will go on. I haven't solved it today. Good believers will continue to disagree. We pray for more light from God's word. But meanwhile, we recognize that we all need humility. Uh, we, need, we need to show love to one another. We need to be generous to one another. And it's fine to have strong convictions as well. I think strong convictions can coexist with, with love at the same time. But, but we also need to remember that we agree on the main things that Jesus is coming back. I mean, that's the main thing, right? Je Jesus wins. Um, righteousness triumphs. Um, th those who resist the Lord will be punished. The, the devil doesn't finally win. I mean, that's, that's John's main point. So we, we can get involved in this debate and we can actually miss the most glorious truth of all, whichever view is right, the, the righteous triumph. Uh, God is going to bring peace to this earth. There's a new creation coming, and we are going to see God's face and enjoy him forever. Thanks for watching Honest Answers. Don't forget to subscribe 